Welcome back to the Mark Claire Show. I've got an incredible, incredible conversation for you today. A nearly two-hour long conversation. And as, as many of you know, I would usually cut off that last half hour, 45 minutes or so, slap it over behind the paywall in the smoke-filled room. But I really felt this conversation, and you'll find out why, especially as we get towards the end, uh, where some of the most incredible material that you're going to hear comes up. I really wanted to make sure to share this one with everybody. So I'm making this a fully public show. Of course, patrons and supporters of the Mark Claire Show. You can find all those links over at markclaire.com. I give you tons of options. You got Patreon. You got Subscribestar. You got Rockfin. You can even now subscribe on Apple Podcasts directly. You become a member on YouTube. I give you all the options galore, okay? Now, who knows how long my shelf life will be on YouTube. We shall see. But I want to give you as many options as possible because, hey, the more I can do this, the more you can help support me, the more I can continue to grow and expand the kind of conversations that I am delivering to you today in this episode, in this conversation with Jerry Marczynski. So, No smoke-filled room, but I will be doing a little separate bonus content for the premium supporters of the Mark Claire Show. Again, you can find all the links over at markclaire.com. That's M-A-R-C-C-L-A-I-R.com. One thing you can do if you are appreciative of this extra-length show, uh, of giving you a full-length show for the public here, you can check out our sponsors, Fox & Sons Coffee, at foxandsons.com, F-O-X-N-S-O-N-S.com. You get 18% off your order when you use the MCS discount code. That is just MCS. Very simple. You're going to love the Fox & Sons Coffee, let me tell you. Steven's always getting more Fancy exotic beans from around the globe. I don't know how the man does it, but he does it, and he does it well. He's also a great family man, teaching his sons about entrepreneurship with this incredible business. And Steve is a real one. I spent a couple hours on the phone uh, with Steve the other day, uh, and he's a real dude. He supports the show because he loves this show. So if you love this show too, please do consider supporting Steve and Fox. Get yourself a bag or two over at foxandsons.com. And my friends, please do enjoy this incredible conversation, if I do say so myself, with Jerry Marzinski. Welcome back to the Mark Claire Show. My guest today is a retired licensed psychotherapist with over 40 year, years of experience working with and studying the thought processes of psychotic and criminally insane patients in some of the most volatile psychiatric institutions in the nation. He is also the co-author of the book, An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind, Breaking the Spell of the Ivory Tower. I'm so pleased to welcome Jerry Marzinski. Jerry, welcome to my show. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here, Jerry. And as we were kind of discussing for a minute before the show, the, the what you get into and the what you've uncovered in your career really does tie into so many of the sort of higher level topics that we get into on the show. But I, I just want to start kind of learning a little bit more about you. Obviously, there's there's your own background that you can you can detail a little bit. But I really want to get to when you first started in- encountering some of these these patients that, that you'll describe today. Uh, when you first started, to, when did you first start to realize within within your own story there that the medical establishment and, the, and what you were learning about mental health, that there was there was something that was missing? Well, I think in undergraduate school, I started suspecting. So, you know, my my upbringing left me with a grave distrust of authority. So that was already programmed in. And, and what I hated about psychology is that there was no way to, except for experimental psychology, there, there, was, there was no way to test what they were talking about. You know, so here's all these, you know, read this and read that and study this and regurgitate all this. But th- there was no way to, to, to find out for yourself. You couldn't go into a mental hospital or, or uh, mental health center. or uh, There was no way to test it out. You, know, you, you just had to believe what they were telling you and then memorize it and spit it back out. Uh, that didn't go over well with me. I mean, even though I did it, I didn't much like it. So the uh, the first inkling I got, so th- not not only did I not trust authority, but I thought that colleges were the last trustful authority there was. Mm. Uh, I'm curious too, since and, you kind of mentioned it. What what was there in your upbringing that sort of already primed you with that distrust of authority? Oh well, my you know my dad uh, breaking virtually every promise he made to me. Mm. Um, then there was a a big one where, with um, I was going for the star star rank in in Boy Scouts, mm-hmm. you know, and it it was hard. I'm, I'm an Eagle Scout memorize. myself. I know all about it. <laughs> so so back then it was they we had to memorize the whole Morse code. I don't know if you had to do that. 
I got a Morse code badge. I, I, I do think I did have to do that for the test. Yeah, for that badge. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't give us a badge. It was just you had to do it okay. just for no <laughs> badge. badge. And uh, so, you know, I did that. I jumped all the hoops for the star star thing. And uh, then I, you know, turned it all into the Scoutmaster. And I said, uh, okay, here, I'm, I'm done all these requirements. And he said, uh, well, no, you're not. I had a talk with your dad. And he says, you're not religious enough. You're not going to church. And wow. he was hypocritical because he hardly went himself. You know? mm. So the scoutmaster said, well, you, you need to go to church. Mm. And I said, for how long? <laughs> <laughs> when does that, when does the box get checked? Four weeks? Yeah, we yeah gonna there's got to be a, a, a <laughs> right. limit to this. Right. Not, not for uh, the rest of my life, certainly. <laughs> so he said, uh, six months. All right. <laughs> So I went for six months, like, you know, I went religiously for six months and, you know, didn't really learn anything much. The, uh, I learned the preacher was having an affair with one of the parishioners, you know, to learn that. I suppose that's uh, a lesson of its own that might have fueled, little, put more fuel on the fire of that general that, sense you were getting that I can't always trust the people to be saying what, you know, that what they say is true. Right. So that just reinforced it. Mm, okay. And, uh, so I, you know, I did my my six months. I turned it turned it in, and uh, uh, he called the preacher, and the preacher said, "Yeah, he was here, but he he certainly wasn't setting the woods on fire." You know, I, I my deal was I would show up. You know, yeah, I, you, I, know, I you never said I had to be deal. into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So I did my part of the deal, and uh, he says, um, "Well, no, I'm not going to give it to you." Wow. The, the, the preacher said, "You weren't really into it." I said, that wasn't part of the deal. The deal was that I would show up, but I showed up. He said, well, I'm not going to give you the badge. And I said, well, I quit. <laughs> Take your I can't believe they gave me that much of a hard time over just star rank even. I mean, the, an eagle, we got a pretty good grilling and maybe even life before that to get really into the, the nerdy weeds here. But uh, yeah, that was I think that was a breeze for most of us. Yeah, I felt I felt the same way. So I, he, he gave it to me probably 20 years later. He finally broke down and he <laughs> it ended up in the mail one day, you know, it was like, uh, all right. So you did realize you were wrong, didn't you? Well, that's good that he, that he sort of, you know, had it his, was his moment. It was after all that time, you know, cause right. I, I, I kept in touch with him. He was a, he was a decent guy. Um, then the next big one was going into college. I thought, well, you know, these guys are almost gods. That's the impression I got from my father when he was going to school. And, uh, I remember a day in in so the college class we were taking abnormal psychology, and the professor said he wanted us to read this article by a um, clinical psychologist who wrote this paper saying that if if two psychotic patients met each other and they both had the same name, one of them would have to switch his identity. And I'm thinking, even as an undergraduate, I'm going. <laughs> What sense does that make? They're both crazy. Why would one of them have really? to, you know, change his name? I mean, if you ran into another person named Mark Claire, you wouldn't change your name into, you know, something else. Right. I, I think mean, it, it was just, it, an odd coincidence, but I, yeah, I probably wouldn't change my name. Right. <laughs> and so I, I was thinking that that doesn't make any sense. You know, but there was no way to check anything out. There, there was no way to, to get into a clinical setting. Uh, matter of fact, I never saw a researcher in the, in the 40 years I was working on the front lines in mental health in all these different settings. I never saw a researcher on the front lines. They were all writing out of the big pharma controlled universities, saying what big pharma and the psychiatric mafia wanted them to say. <laughs> they weren't they weren't investigating the front lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, fast forward about uh, four five, six, seven, maybe eight years. I'd already graduated from, from the master's program, and I was doing um, uh, rounds on the second floor of a big psychiatric unit at Central State Hospital. This place was massive. It was the size of a small city. It was the biggest psychiatric hospital on the planet at the time. There were 10,000 patients there when I got there. You know, and that was down from about 21 a few years before that. So it was it was a small city that had its own uh, food factory, its its own central kitchen, its own heating facilities. I mean, it it, it was like a small town in and of itself. And um, 
So I was doing the rounds on this psychiatric unit, and I saw a, a new patient, and he was talking. It looked like to himself, but he was carrying on a coherent conversation. And and it, it sounded like one part of a telephone conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, and what they taught us in uh, in college was that the voices were hallucinations. And I'm thinking, well, if they're hallucinations, they're like word salad. They don't make any sense. They're just garbage, you know, uh, nonsensical words. You know, that's not what I was hearing, you know, from a number of them. They were arguing with these voices. They were talking with these voices. They were, there was one one lady that she was being, arguing with the voices as she was leaving the hospital. So she was arguing with the voices that she didn't want to leave the hospital as she was leaving the hospital grounds. So uh, the voices weren't what I th- thought they were. I mean, these these were coherent conversations that, that these people were carrying on. So I heard this guy talk, and I kind of snuck up behind him and wanted to kind of hear what he was talking to with these voices. But he caught me, you know, before I could pick up anything. And uh, he turns around and I said, well, hey, I haven't seen you here before. Um, My name's Jerry. I'm the psych on this unit. Um, What's your name? And he goes, he looks at me in the eye and he says, well, I'm Jesus Christ. And, you know, I think back to that abnormal class and I'd look at him in the eye and I say, no, 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 you're not Jesus Christ because I am. And I'm like sitting there wondering like, okay, what's he going to do? You know, is he is he going to change his name like this clinical psychologist said he was? Is he <laughs> right. going to change into somebody else? And I'm sitting there waiting, and he cocks his eyes up, and he's thinking like, uh, well, and then he looks at me and he goes, okay, we can both do Jesus Christ. And he kind of strolls off. <laughs> and I went, okay, what else? That's did not they what they said he'd do in the book. They said he can't <laughs> have the same name. It's already falling apart. <laughs> yeah. So th- that was another, you know, it's like, okay, what else did they lie to me about? Mm. Yeah. So the the second thing I thought, so I was already wary. Now, what struck me as really strange is this was a massive hospital, and I was I was very interested in abnormal psychology, and there there was every psychopathy pathology in that place that you could imagine. They, they were all there somewhere, you know. You could see them all, and uh, I was like a kid in the candy store. And uh, I was also an adrenaline junkie. Yeah, that helped a lot. <laughs> so uh, I imagine, yeah, I imagine there's a lot of um, uh, adrenaline spiking moments working at a place like that. Oh, uh, th- there was. And uh, so what I saw was that nobody in that entire hospital that I was around was at the least bit interested in what those voices were telling these patients, you know. And after several months, it was clear to me that those voices were somehow affecting their behavior in a negative way. You know, I didn't know how, but you could see it. They listen to the voices and they start acting up. They start doing stupid stuff. They start doing destructive and crazy stuff. And the the medicines were being given to them to suppress the voices. That that was one of the purposes. So um, what are the medicines that they that they were prescribing these patients, by the way? Uh, phenothiazines. They were the, back then. It was Thorazine and Melaril. Uh, Are those still used today? Yeah, there's Thorazine's pretty rough. <laughs> it's pretty crude. Uh, Melaril, I think, is still uh, used. Uh, there was another one called um, started with an S. Stelazine. You know, and, so, um, so they're still used, but they had they they all had fairly nasty side effects. So so what? The psychiatric mafia and big pharma are doing is producing these same kinds of meds that are still ser- serving as major tranquilizers, but with less severe side effects. Mm. You know, they still rot the patient's brain out with long-term use. They're still awful meds. You know, but um, nobody nobody was interested in what these voices were telling these people. You know. The other thing I saw is that I, I would ask all the psychiatrists I worked around, all the psych nurses, I said, what, what causes schizophrenia? And, uh, you know, some of the more honest ones would say, we don't know. But I, I would say 
85 to 90 percent of them would say, well, it's a chemical imbalance of the brain. It's not really this an answer, though, because what, what causes that imbalance then? Well, what struck me is I never watched them or I never saw them give any kind of take any kind of baseline. So if you're if you're saying there's a chemical imbalance of the brain before you start treating it, you would think you'd want to know what chemicals are out of balance. I think, uh, what are there, 23 different neurotransmitters or something like that? You know, which of them are out of balance and by how much? You know, you'd think that you would want some kind of baseline to start with. So if there's an imbalance, what's out of balance and how much and what do you give to fix it? That never happened. They would just reach into their bag of medicines and go, well, I think I'll start with this one. And if that one didn't work, it would be another one. If that one didn't work, we'd change it to another one. And they, they only spent like 15 minutes a, a month with these guys. They ask them, how are your medicines doing? Well, I don't like them. Okay, we'll change it to another one, see if you like that any better. You know? <laughs> they never took any baseline ever. And I'm like, well, how do you know what's out of balance or how much? I, I asked one. They said, oh, we don't worry about it. The drug companies take care of that. I'm like, what, what do you mean the drug companies Oh, they've already done the that? research, so we're fine. They, they, that's right. They've already done the research. Wow. And I, it blew my mind. I'm like, w what? You know, that's like letting the fox loose in the hen house. Did you find this you guy were the was, only person asking these kinds of questions around I was there? the only person. Only person. Only one. And I got in trouble for it. Just you know, for asking the, the questions. Just for asking the questions. When I started, see, the, the staff didn't know what the voices were. They didn't much care. They weren't curious about it. They were told that they were hallucinations, and that's what they believed. You know, But they, they weren't the least bit curious about them or what they were saying or how they behaved or what they were doing. They weren't asking any questions. They were just dishing out medicine. They had been brainwashed in the institutions to believe they were hallucinations, and that's what they believed. So none of them knew what the voices were other than hallucinations or how they operated or what they were saying to these people. So I started asking the schizophrenics themselves. And it, it took about a year to figure out how to do that because they were they don't call them paranoid schizophrenics for nothing. You know, they they're paranoid. And they got good reason, because there is no positive outcome to answering questions about the voices. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but the voices themselves punished the person for talking about them. The other thing is they, they lost all their friends. When they start talking about these voices to their friends, their friends go, uh, you're weird. You know, you're, something's wrong with you. You're possessed or something's wrong with you. You're off. And they lose their friends. So they start uh, t telling their parents, well, I'm hearing these ugly voices. And their parents get all upset. And, you know, they see they're behaving strangely and they take them to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist pronounces them mentally ill and puts them on these awful medications that make them feel awful, you know? So there is no positive outcome. And they don't for, stop the voices either. The and, and no, they will, they will quiet them, but they won't stop them. And, and the voices are horrible. They're, they're like, you know, they say things like, you're no good, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're, you're ridiculous, you're, nobody loves you. Uh, the most vile things that you can imagine, that's what these voices are telling these and is that, is that consistent across all schizophrenics? Is it yes. always negative? Negatively? Well, the, the paranoid schizophrenics. Okay, paranoid. That's a, that's that, a specific that's the subsect biggest, of, of schizophrenia? That, that's a significant sub... That they're, they're the biggest group. And that's not only significant for the state hospital I worked at. When I went to work in the psychology of the state prison here in Arizona, it was the same thing. Same patterns. Same exact patterns. It was... It was like they were all made from some cosmic cookie cutter or all programmed by some cosmic cookie cutter somewhere to, to, to say the same kind of stuff. You know, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're, you're rotten, uh, nobody loves you, you're, you're weak, you're uh, every rotten thing you can think of. You know? And so it was the same there, it was the same here. And now that I'm, I've got my own private practice, I'm working with people all over the world. It's the same for everybody. People in France, Germany, England, uh, Peru, um, um, you know, all over the Western world. The same. They're saying the same things. 
in that particular language, but it's all the same stuff. And there's there's 23, I found 23 different patterns that they run. Okay? Bottom line is if they're running patterns, they're not hallucinations. Hallucinations are random. They're all over the place. They're, some are positive, some are negative, some are, they're all over the place. You know, the first pattern I noticed was that these voices were all consistently negative, mm-hmm. all of them. And if they weren't, it was only to get the patient's trust, and then they'd hit them later behind the back. So uh, they were derogatory. They were consistently negative. They were insulting. They were abusive. They were destructive. Um, the question was, why weren't they random? If, if the psychiatric mafia is saying that they are hallucinations, why aren't they random like hallucinations? Second question is, what is holding them on that negative path? Why aren't they random? Why aren't they meandering all over the place? Why are they just consistently negative all the time? What holds them negative? You know, it was a... Uh, it reminded me of that uh, that movie, uh, The Enemy Below, where there was a destroyer chasing a German U-boat. And every time the destroyer captain lost that U-boat, that U-boat would turn onto a certain course. And when the captain lost him, he would turn back onto that course and stay on that course until he caught up with him again. You know, same thing with these things. They're on a certain negative course, and they stay on that course, and something is holding them on that on that negative course. Yeah. So th- that came from from asking questions to the schizophrenics at the state hospital about these voices. So I was slowly getting information from them, and they they were very distrustful of psych staff because basically our job was to. If, if they went off their meds and they were starting to act crazy, our job was to turn them into psychiatry and psychiatry would drug them again. So we weren't the highest trusted among them either. You know? And they would lie to the psychiatrists about the voices. After they saw how bad the, the medicines were, you know, the psychiatrist would, would uh, ask them, do you still hear voices? And they go, oh, no, 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 I'm not hearing voices oh, anymore. all gone, thanks. You can check them oh, They're all gone, <laughs> yes, yep. I'm good fine. To go, thanks. Yep. Good to go. Exactly. <laughs> that was exactly what happened. You know, and then they're still hearing them, but they're not going to tell psychiatry. Well, voices anything. or not, that's probably what I would say too, because I imagine no matter what, I'd want to get the hell out of that, that place. Yeah. And those medicines are awful. You know, they're they're terrible. Today's episode is sponsored by Fox and Sons Coffee. And let me just tell you, Stephen of Fox and Sons, he is not just an advertiser. He has been a supporter of this show from day one. And frankly, since before day one, because he came over with me from the old Lions of Liberty days. So true fan of the show. He started this company, Fox and Sons, out of his love for coffee and really out of wanting to further bond with his sons and spend time with him, just like he shared time with his father drinking coffee. Uh, He also gets to teach his sons about entrepreneurship entrepreneurship and business through this endeavor. So I'm so happy to have Stephen and really his whole family, the Fox and the Sons, the whole gang as a supporters and sponsors of this show. Not only that, his beans are so high quality, fresh. Look, I just got two new bags right here. I got the Mexican and my favorite, the Den Blend Dark. The beans are super high quality, fresh and sourced from small organic farms, fair trade. None of this GMO garbage. They're all small batch roasted. This is high quality stuff. Subscriptions are by far the best way to get your coffee. I have a couple subscriptions going, uh, but that is the way to go. You never run out that way. I never run out. I always have my supply of Fox and Sons. So I want you to head over to foxandsons.com. Put in your order today. They ship fast. They ship now through the end of February. Also, by the way, you're going to get free shipping on any order over $37.99. By the way, while you're there, use discount code MCS to get 18% off any order over $25. Stephen Fox is a great man, a great friend, great supporter of the show. I encourage you to check out his coffee over at foxandsons.com. In the process of asking these questions, one of the uh, uh, schizophrenics got upset. He didn't like me asking the questions, or more likely, the voices didn't like me asking those questions. So he went to the psychiatrist, and he said, hey, this guy's asking me questions I don't like. It's upsetting me. He's asking me about the voices. Next thing I knew, I was up on the red carpet in the psychiatrist's office. Door closed. 
being given the third degree and being told, you will not ask these patients questions about their voices. You, they are hallucinations. And when you're asking questions about the, the hallucinations, you're reinforcing them. You're making the patient worse. You know, I knew that like was the scene from a, a movie where you're like, you're the investigator and you're finally, you're, you know, you're, you've, you've realized that the organization itself is in on it in some way. Now, I don't know if that means they know what the voices really are that you would get into, but they're certainly not interested in you finding out what they are. Yeah, that was for sure. And that happened twice. Okay. And one of the reasons for that was, and, and this was strange when I first got to that large state hospital, I noticed that psychiatrists were being beat up at a rate much higher than any of the other staff. Psychiatrists were being assaulted at a rate as high or almost as high as the attendant staff that are working with these psychotic patients 24 hours a day. And they were only spending like 15, 20 minutes a month with them. So my dilemma was, what are they saying to these patients in 20 minutes a month that is getting them beat up? It made no sense to me. But it just kept happening over and over and over again. You know, back then we didn't have any cell phones. We just had these, you know, button dial up kind of phones where you push the buttons and it would dial. So the the um, the grapevine was in the hospital cafeteria because we're, this hospital was in the middle of nowhere. We had to drive thirty miles into Macon, Georgia, just to get a hamburger. <laughs> there was nothing there except for the hospital food. So everybody met and ate lunch together. And that's where, you know, where we learned what was happening on the different psychiatric units. You know, all the staff would meet together. And here was assault after assault after assault on psychiatrists. And it made no sense to me. And it didn't make any sense for seven years. At, at the end of seven years, uh, there was this one gal, she was in cosmetology class. I'm fast forwarding past a lot of other stuff here. Uh, and what we did is the only thing we had back then was the the medications. That's the only treatment they had. You know, counseling these these schizophrenic patients was like shooting a rhino in the butt with a BB rifle. It didn't have any effect whatsoever. None. It was a waste of breath. So most counselors didn't didn't really spend a lot of time with the schizophrenics. So the only thing to, that they really had for them were these medicines. And uh they, the patients didn't like those medicines, and uh, they would always go off them. You know, eventually they would go off them, and then they would get crazy again. And that made no sense to me. It's like the medicines were the only things that were keeping them sane, and they were quitting them. Why were they doing that? You know, were they were they quitting them to go insane again? Did they like being insane? Because this this happened to almost all of them. You know, they would hit a certain point and they would go, okay, I'm quitting the meds. And then they'd go off them. And I'd get a call from one of the uh, vocational instructors. Hey, uh, Sammy's going nuts here in the auto shop. You need to come over here and get him and put him back on his meds. You know, it's like, so it happened so frequently. I'm like, what is going on here? So I started, I started this, this listing of, um, I got off the trail of my original Story. Well, that's all right. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no defined trail here. We can go wherever, wherever <laughs> okay. it goes. Well, I'll, I'll see if I can remember to get back to it. So I, I, I started asking these guys, like, these medicines are the only thing that keep you functional. They're the only thing that allow you to read and study and, and not act like a lunatic. Why are you going off them? The consistent answer was the side effects. The side effects are horrible. Okay. But the, the effects of, of being psychotic are very horrible. They're really bad, you know? I mean, you have monsters chasing you, people that, you know, you're paranoid, somebody's coming through the window to kill you. You're being watched, uh, you know, cameras in the room, uh, demons attacking you. I mean, all these horrible things that schizophrenics experience when they get become florid. It's, um, so it's, it's like, well, that's not making any sense. So I went to the DSM and I got a listing of all the all the facets of paranoid schizophrenia. You know the hallucinations, the paranoia, the uh, all the rotten things that happen to schizophrenics. And 
I, after every single one quit their, their medications and they put them back on medications, I'd bring them in my office and I'd say, why'd you quit your meds? Do you, do you like being crazy? What's going on? Why did you do that? And they go, well, the side effects were awful. Okay, granted. Okay, the side effects are awful. I said, what's worse? You know, the side effects or being schizophrenic. So I, I gave them two sheets of paper. I'd give them one and I'd tell them, write down all the horrible side effects of your medicine because they all didn't have the same rotten side effects. You know? So they'd finish that and they'd have five or six awful side effects. And then I'd give them the description of what it's like to be a paranoid schizophrenic. You know, the, the hallucinations, the paranoia, the, the confusion, the... Uh, uh, the demons attacking, you know, stuff coming out of the walls, I mean, all that kind of stuff. And, and I'd give them that, a check sheet, and I'd say, Ch check all, all these symptoms you've had when you were completely psychotic. And they'd check off a whole bunch of these things, and then I'd hand them both back to them, and I'd say, uh, which is worse? Consistently, they would say that the symptoms of psychosis were much worse than the side effects from the medicines. And then I'd ask them, well, then why'd you go off the meds? And their answer was, I don't know. That went on for years. And this is across, like, consistent across many different patients with the same answer. Many different patients in different units. You know? And it was, it was completely consistent. So I had no idea why that was happening. And they couldn't tell me. They didn't know. You know, that was the answer to every single one of them. I felt like a crazy guy myself asking them the same question. You got to be over asking yourself, are these guys having secret meetings and, and kind of coordinating their answers? I mean, it's got to be driving you mad, like you said. Yeah. Oh, they was. It was frustrating. And I go, and I go well, then why'd you go off your meds? If, if, if the symptoms of psychosis are much worse than the side effects, then why'd you do it? I don't know. I don't know why I did it. All of them. It was like some science fiction something, you know, it was like uh, outer limits time. Right, you know, right. do, 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 do. I don't know. Something took me over. I don't know. Uh -huh. but, but, uh, yeah. So seven, fast forward another seven years. It was the last year I was working at the hospital. And here's this one gal I had in a cosmetology class. She was doing good. She would have made a good cosmetologist. She'd already gone off her meds two times. If they went off them three times, we just assumed that they weren't going to stay on them when they left the hospital and that we were wasting our training money on people who weren't going to stay on the meds, which is the only thing they had at the time. Okay. So we would, we would usually discharge them. Say, okay, you yeah, know, go home to your family. You, you know, you can't oh, stay well, on the meds. Off you go, I guess. Right. Off I mean, you there's, go. There's nowhere. There's no other option. Huh? There's no other option. We'll say, we'll we'll find another one who will stay on the meds. Hope, hope those voices get nicer, I guess. See ya. Yeah. So the one, when, when we when we told her mother, when she told her mother, her mother called me and was just begging me, like, uh, please, please don't do that. Please don't send her back here. I can't deal with her. Um, she's, she's, she she's does, does well when she's on her meds. She's doing well in her classes. Let me come up and, and we'll talk to her together and find out why she, you know, went off her meds. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to have an ally to help me ask her why she went off her meds. You know, so the first time I had an ally. So the mother showed up on Friday afternoon and we're in my office and the mother and I are both asking her, why did you go off your meds? You know, well, I didn't like the side effects. Well, we, you know, I gave her the side effects and, and just said some of what's, what's worse, the side effects or the psychosis? She goes, well, the psychosis is worse. Well, then why did you go off your meds? And her mother and I are both sitting there waiting for an answer. Finally, she says, you won't believe me. I said, uh, try me. I've heard some pretty weird stuff since I've been here. I don't think you're going to upset me with anything. You know? And uh, she says, the voices told me that I was being poisoned mm. and that the psychiatrist was poisoning me. And the voices were pointing to the side effects of the medications and telling me, that I was being poisoned by the psychiatrist. So I that's went off why the when they broke it down themselves, they would go, well, yes, obviously the psychosis is worse. But when the answer actually came, it's, it's, it's the voice telling them they're being poisoned. That is what would come through and then put them off the meds. 
Yeah, and I think I have uh, I have a transcript where somebody else was saying the same thing. I thought I have to find. I got two trans two fairly short transcripts here, but uh, let me move down the little line before I get that, and I'll, I can read yeah, yeah. those. Yeah, we can get to um, those later for sure. So that then it clicked into place. You know, it's like that's why the psychiatrists are getting the crap kicked out of, and nobody else is. Mm -hmm. They're the ones dishing out these medications. You know, and the voices are telling all these other ones. Yeah, you're being poisoned too. I've heard that over and over and over again. The psychiatrist is poisoning me. It's so interesting that in this in this sea of madness in in these hospitals that you're in, that you're actually finding finally it seems like like something logical in a, in a way. Even if you can't explain it, there is like a logical. Okay, they are attacking the psychiatrist for a, a reason, a reason connected to, to what these voices are telling them. But our, our, most of the real doctors, quote unquote, real doctors, there would say. Well, you don't listen to the voices because the voices aren't aren't real, so we don't have to worry about what they're actually saying. Oh, they're very real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're very real. Just because the psychiatrist didn't hear them doesn't mean they don't exist. Mm -hmm. And they run the same patterns again. You know, so that explained why psychiatrists were getting beat up, only spending twenty minutes a month with these people. Then it made sense. It took seven years to come to that conclusion, and since then I've heard. Scores of other patients tell me the same thing. You know, the voices are telling them they're being poisoned by the psychiatrist. Yeah. So the, the, the negativity was the first pattern I saw. The second pattern I saw was that the voices were any religious. They didn't like these patients reading the Bible. They didn't like them going to church. They didn't like them reading any kind of spiritual material. And what I noticed is when the chaplain gave like an ice cream social in the, the big meeting room downstairs in the, in the psych center, the schizophrenics would never go. They all sat on the dingy ward and laid in bed, you know, reading murder mysteries or something like that. Um, and I did, uh, the first time I saw that, I, I said, that's odd. You know, all, all the schizophrenics on my, on my caseload are all in bed. They're not down during, you know, eating the cake and ice cream. And that was, that was hard to come by. Yeah, yeah. You know? So the first time I just noticed it, the second time it happened, I, it got my curiosity and I started asking them questions. How, how come you're not down there with the other patients, you know, eating cake and ice cream and dancing and, and uh, you know, attending the, the little bruja that the uh, chaplain is running down there? You know, oh, we don't we don't like chaplains. Uh, I don't there is no God. uh, uh I, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to listen to that dribble. You know, they were totally anti-religious. You know, they, um, so I, that got my attention. And, and I saw that some patients <clears throat> were persisting in reading their Bibles. You know, and uh, I, would, I got curious. I would ask them, I said, uh, well, how do your voices react when you read the Bible? They said they got louder. They didn't like it. You know, and then that was consistent also. And another strange incident there is that the voices, if the, if the patient insisted on reading the Bible, if they would not quit because they knew something was wrong, you know, and they were turning to the Bible for answers to help fight whatever this awful thing was. Because they're not getting them from the, the doctors and the psychiatrists, certainly. That's right. So so they're turning to, re to religion. Mm. And... Uh, you know, and if they insisted on reading the Bible, the voices would tell them, okay, if you're going to read the Bible, you need to read it from cover to cover. You know, you can't just start where you want to. And the patient would go, okay, fine. So they'd start reading it from cover to cover. And then they would get to the part of the Bible where this guy begat that guy, begat that guy, who begat that guy. And it just goes on for 30 pages of who begot who for, you know, forever, just yeah. boring. <laughs> and the voices would jump in there and then, why are you reading this crap? You know, Jesus couldn't even save himself. What makes you think he's going to save you? They want to stop this you from getting, they to tell the, getting to the good stuff. Like, just, no, just start with the boring, the, the weird, dry, uh, here's all the people that lived for these amount of times, and then they'll never right. get further. 
That's right. It's and they, kind of ingenious they, they, in, a, in a way. Yeah. In a way, you know, diabolical. I've actually ingenious. noticed, I, I have tried to start reading, this is interesting, I mean, I, I tried to start reading the Bible a few times, and I, I kind of always get stuck in that same part, and, <laughs> and then I, I've decided, you know what, maybe I'll just like open it sometimes and check it out, and that, that seems like a more fulfilling method, actually. So it's interesting that the demons would also, uh, or the entities, we haven't unveiled them yet. Uh, yeah, they, uh, they, they knew it. On the same path, yeah. Yeah, they knew it. So I'm like, why would a hallucination be anti-religious? You know, why would a hallucination care? So I started asking these uh, some of the other schizophrenics who went to church. You know, every schizophrenic I found who went to church or had gone to church, I'd get start asking them, and I, I was always bashing these guys with questions. You know, but I had to be careful. Um, so, so this is before I got caught. These these uh, these first three. These first three patterns, you know, the negativity, the anti-religious. So I started asking them, what what do your voices do when you go to church? How do they react? And it broke down into three different categories. If the voices were very weak, they would just shut up. They, they wouldn't do anything. If the voices were of moderate strength, as soon as the preacher started talking, they would start over-talking him. You know, like, oh, listen to this garbage this guy's saying, and why are you listening to this crap? I mean, you know, just mocking the preacher and, and just distracting the patient so they couldn't hear anything the preacher was saying. Okay? So voices were very strong. They would, the patient would jump up and run out of the church like he was being driven out, you know. So it broke up into those three categories. So it was like, why would a hallucination care about religion? You know, that doesn't make any sense. So I started asking more questions, and eventually one patient came and said, uh, when the voices come, I repeat the 23rd Psalm. The voices absolutely hate it. He said it's like throwing worms on a hot frying pan. That's how they react to the 23rd Psalm. And I went, well, that's interesting. You know, why would that happen? So I started handing out the 23rd Psalm to all these other patients, said, read this when the voices come, tell me what happens. And it was a similar reaction. There was a, a very volatile reaction on the part of the voices. They hated it. You know? And again, I'm asking, like, why would that happen? You know? um, why would a hallucination care? You know? So something wasn't quite right with what I'd been taught, you know, Third one is that they foster and create negative emotion. So they're constantly trying to get the, the, the patient into a state of an, a negative emotional state of anger, anxiety, paranoia, shame, and guilt. You know, constantly badgering them. You remember when you did this thing? You remember when you said this? To you, you know, da, 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 and, and just kind of throwing it up to them over and over again, like rubbing it into their face, some of the bad stuff they'd done, you know. And then what I found is once they succeeded at that, their energy level dropped, and they could feel that energy level drop. You know? So that I found that interesting, um, that there, there was an associated energy drop when the voices showed up, you know, after they left. Um, so it, it, when you say like these these the stronger these entities get or the the, the voices get or the, the more influence they exert on the patient or the victim or whatever you want to call them the the more physical actual energy that the patient would lose. Yes. And and they didn't have to be actually doing anything to lose it. Um when I was working in the prison I remember one fella uh he was so drained he couldn't even get up in the morning to eat breakfast. And all he was doing was tossing and turning in his bed all night. So that was a consistent thing also. Um, and so what I, what I did was there was like a, I came up with one to ten scales. So, and I would give these to all the schizophrenics that I was working with. And I said, how much energy did you have on the one to ten scale before the voices attacked you? And how much energy did you have after the, the voices attacked you? You know, so it would be like, and before the voices attacked, it would be like, you know, six or seven, eight, maybe. And then after the voices attacked, it would be down to, 
you know, three, two, or one. And it was consistent. So uh, I think uh, at one point we ran an analysis of variance on it, and that was statistically significant. So here's another pattern showing up. Right. And once again, if the voices are running patterns, they can't be hallucinations as the psychiatric mafia and big pharma insist. You know, and they haven't ever studied the voices. They haven't done a single study on the voices. And yet All they, they have said, the, the perfect pills for them somehow. They have the perfect pills for them. And it's like, it, it reminds me of the old ancient Egyptians that just go, hey, we hereby declare that the voices are hallucinations because we said so. Mm -hmm. And we're the doctors and we got the, we got the PhD and we got the medical degree and we're the psychiatrists. So we're in the know. We're the we've experts. Got the la we've got the white coat. So what we more got the white coat <laughs> right. and we got the diploma. So you better listen to us. Mm -hmm. You know? And here's all this stuff just not making sense, you know, over and over and over. You know, it was like um, it ended up being like some 23 patterns, I believe it was. And uh, I can go through them quickly. You know, so, so what what we have here is the operational definition of what these voices are how they manifest in physical reality, okay? So they're energetic entities, but the only way you know what they are and how they operate is the effect they have on physical reality okay? that you can observe. It's almost like a magnetic field, okay? You, you get a big magnet with a magnetic field. You can't see that magnetic field. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. For all practical purposes, for the human being, with all your senses, it doesn't exist. You can't see it. You can't sense it. You get a bottle of iron filings and you put it on that magnetic field, and now you can see the magnetic field take shape. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the same thing with these patterns. And what psychiatry is doing is they're dealing with a energetic entity, an energetic illness, and with a physical drug. So it, it's it's almost akin to taking a bottle of Thorazine and pouring on it on a magnetic field and expecting that magnetic field to disappear. You know, if if you put enough of that crap on the magnetic field, it's going to distort it, but it's not going to get rid of it. And that's what they're doing. So what Big Pharma did is they started out blaming. Um, so they never they never knew what caused schizophrenia. So they had to come up with something so they didn't look like a bunch of dummies. So first back in uh, back in the day, fifties uh, or something like that, they were blaming mothers. Oh, the mothers did something. The mothers said something. The mothers, you know, da, da. the mothers are like, wait a minute, we didn't do anything. You know, we're just being mothers. I mean, you know, and and you know, there were some good ones and there were some bad ones, but there were schizophrenics with good mothers. I mean, it just you could see it. It, it just there was nothing there. You know, anybody could observe it. So what they had to do was kick it upstairs. So they, they kicked it up uh, up into genetics, saying, well, there's a schizophrenic gene. It's the genes that cause schizophrenia. And they got away with that for a decade or so. Yeah, well, and then the, the, the biogeneticist said, we don't see any schizophrenic gene. There, there isn't any schizophrenic gene. So here comes big pharma and, and, and the psychiatric mafia going, well, it's it's not just one gene. It's a mixture of thousands of genes that they interacted with you know, and, then, and we'll never figure it out, but it's a gene somehow. Yeah. And, and the bio, biochemists are, are saying, yeah, we're not seeing any. You know? So it was debunked. So they had to come up with another way to kind of throw people off and and, and make people believe that they knew what was going on when they really didn't know what was going on. So that's when they came up with this biochemical imbalance. And that was come up, that, that was came up by Eli Lilly, a drug company who completely made it up back when Prozac came out. So they see this problem that exists uh, out there. They see that there's a lot of these, uh, you know, paranoid schizophrenics and they say, well, no one really knows what causes this, but we can certainly tell them we have the solution and just start essentially manufacturing these pills. 
With well, yeah, we know what it is. And since the pills do quiet down the voices and these people do seem to regain some semblance of sanity, what we what we do works. So we're the one. We're we're it. We're the ones. So do you have any so, thoughts about how the, the pills, you say they quiet the voices, but they obviously don't turn them off entirely because the voices are still able to say, don't take the pills, you're being poisoned. So what do you have any thoughts about how the pills quiet the voices, but don't quite shut them off? Well, they're major tranquilizers. Okay, so they're going to quiet they're everything the, going on. In your yeah, body. they're going to, they're gonna, they're gonna t- t- you know, they kind of, they drug the brain. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if uh, uh, the, you don't stop thinking when you take these things. You're, you're still thinking, but you're not thinking as fast or as furiously. Gotcha. And these voices, they put thoughts into your thought stream. Okay? They're feeding it, and they're feeding it in order to upset you to make you paranoid, to make you anxious, to make you jittery and jumpy. And they want that negative emotional energy. That's what they feed off of. They're parasites. Yeah. So you know, back to Eli Lilly with the, uh, the Prozac thing. Here's, here's an article. It was, says it was not until late 1980s after the release of the landmark antidepressant Prozac that the idea of the chemical imbalance hit the psychiatric mainstream. As the psychiatrist Peter Brigham, 1991, points out in his book, Toxic Psychiatry, the drug, Eli, the drug company Eli Lilly advanced the chemical imbalance theory as a marketing scheme for their new drug Prozac. There was, of course, no demonstrable evidence showing that depressed patients had any imbalance, but Lilly ran with it. Long, before long, psychiatrists and psychiatric patients alike came to identify with the idea that mental disorders are caused by a chemical imbalance of the brain. It was a complete lie, a complete fabrication. And this is what they're basing all their drugs on, is a lie. This chemical imbalance has never been there. They just came out with another article showing that there is no serotonin. So what the, what the, the psychiatric mafia and Big Pharma were saying is that serotonin is out of balance. So they created these antidepressants that block the reuptake of serotonin. So um, once the serotonin is used, the body will destroy it. So it blocked that destructive process so the ter- serotonin would keep activating the, ne- the neurons. It didn't much work. Okay? And it's been proven that there is no serotonin uh, lack in depressed people you know so all this is duplistic it's all made up you know along with their dsm that was all made up also their their bible so here's here's more and more duplistic stuff coming up that uh you know made no sense but these patterns continued so as i went from the state hospital uh where i had to be real careful about not upsetting these patients because you had you had two things going on is that psychiatrists were being beat up at a, a horrendous rate so the unwritten rule in the psych hospital was you don't upset psychotics because you don't know what they're going to do you know they seem to be going off on psychiatrists for little or nothing so psychiatrists don't want you doing anything to upset them so that that's where i kind of got in trouble there um so where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. So I had to be careful of questioning them in the, in the state hospital. Uh, when I got to the state prison in the psychology department of the state prison, that was no longer a factor. You know, if, if one of the uh, schizophrenic patients I was working with went to the warden and said, hey, uh, you know, the, the psych is asking me all these questions and I don't like it. He's upsetting me. <laughs> the warden would say, get out of my face, man. Go play in the traffic. Get, go, go, go pick up cigarette butts off the yard. Get out of my face. You know, so the prison was set, set up to deal with violent patients. So they, they weren't worried about it. So what I had around me then was a body of maybe 10 or 12 psychotic patients who I made a deal with to tell me in real time what their voices were telling them when we were in session together. So the deal was, you know, I'll help you out as much as I can, but the deal is you tell me what the voices are telling you. So you were trying to, you're sort of getting on their side and being like, 
kind of letting them in on the fact that like you kind of know this isn't correct the way it's being approached maybe not so on the nose but you're kind of making a informal agreement like look i'm going to try to help you out here but i i got to know more about what these voices are actually telling you right yeah that was kind of so you know it was like they were curious like a movie plot jerry (laughs) It, it was it was and they were curious about what the voices were too they didn't know what they were a lot of them you know and they would ask the voices they'd ask them who are you what are you and the voices would say we are you if they believed that, then they became the voices because the voices were running their minds at that point. Mm. You know? So there was always a battle with the person between the voices because they could sense that those voices weren't who they were. And is that meant in, to get the in person many cases. To, to sort of acquiesce and, and maybe eventually think, oh, well, th- these voices are just me, so I'll just sort of give in and then maybe be more under control of the, of the, of the entities? Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, a lot of them didn't know. They thought they were them. Right. You know, they thought because we're all taught from the time we're little kids. You know, every every thought that that comes into your head belongs to you. You're so brilliant, little Johnny. You had that thought. I mean, yeah, we all think it's our own. Yeah, you know, it's like you all think it's your own, and mm-hmm. yeah, that's what we're brought up with. That's far from the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, and the voices take take they take full advantage of that. You know, it's like, oh yeah, that thought's yours. You know, go smack that guy in the face, you know, or or go steal some cigarettes or, you know, and it's thing by thing by thing. Now, keep in mind what the voices want is conflict. They want anxiety. They want paranoia. They want all those negative emotions that they feed off of. So they will tell the victim to go do things that will generate that negative emotion, you know, and then they were energetically drain the victim. You know, so. You know, go go rob the store. Uh, you know, go to the bar and pick up uh, prostitutes. I mean, uh, yeah, stuff like that. Are yeah. are the entities trying to intentionally get them in trouble and get them into another, like into a jail or into an institution? Is that part of? Oh yeah, why they they send them out of, down that path. Yeah, because because the prison and jails are are completely negative places. Oh, it's gonna they're gonna yeah. have so many friends around. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, there's it's a it's a very paranoid, very anxiety provoking place to be. And you don't want to go to a prison or jail. It's like a it's like a resort for the entities. Then, oh yeah, it's like, a yeah all, all, our, all my coolest friends are all here. Right, and you can you can feel it when you walk in there. I mean, every time I'd walk in that that gate to the, the front gate to the prison, it was like oh, you know, you could just feel it. They want those people in prison, and they don't want them getting out. So here, here they they take these. They've closed down all the state hospitals, virtually all of them, which kept these people semi-sane at a cost much less than prison does. They dumped them out into the streets. They had no way to to work. They couldn't work. They were too messed up. So they'd start selling drugs and using drugs and and uh, uh, stealing stuff, and and get themselves in prison. So now you have the same schizophrenics that were being taken care of in the state hospitals at a much less co- much less cost now in a prison situation where they have to pay for guards and and sensing devices and barbed wire and fences and and all this security it's much more expensive. So these are the same guys now they're in prison. So they keep them in prison for years, they're psychotic, they're being beat up, they're being tr- uh, taught to be better criminals they're getting angrier and more vi- violent and volatile all the time and then when their time is up then they let them out give them 50 bucks get a taxi cab be on your way you're, do they stay on time. meds in prison or are they just well what they did is they they don't like giving them because they cost so much so what i saw was in, unless the patient caused problems for them they didn't give them any medications right. So if he's just in the corner talking to his voices, yeah, he doesn't. He's all right. He doesn't. Yeah, he's fine. Yeah, you know, but if he's screaming and and yelling and uh, <laughs> causing all kinds of problems, then they get voices. Uh, get the medicines. Mm-hmm. You know, but even even then, I remember a situation where uh, the chief psychologist was in cahoots with one of the psychiatrists. And they were on psychiatrists constantly not to dish out so many meds because it was costing them a fortune. 
you know, and the psychiatrist who practiced psychiatry as you would in the community, they were under constant attack for giving out too much, too much medication. So this uh, chief psychologist, he put one of his stooges in the medical unit to when we would send psychotic patients there and saying, hey, they're heating up, they need to be medicated. This psychiatrist or psychologist, he would say, well, they're no, they're not psychotic, they're personality disorders and he'd send them back. Okay, so I had this one psychotic patient prisoner. He was he was getting more and more amped up. He was getting more and more psychotic. He was threatening this other patient, this other this other prisoner, and it was getting worse and worse and worse. And he was going to attack this guy eventually. So I sent him to the medical unit the first time. This stooge sent him back. I sent him a second time with more documentation as to how psychotic this guy was getting, the threats he was making, that he was imminently dangerous and that he needed to be medicated. They sent him back again saying, oh, he's a personality disorder. I sent him back a third time with even more documentation saying, this guy's going to hurt somebody. You need to do something, you know, with all the, the, the pages of write-up and pages of documentation. They sent him back a third time. And two weeks later, he stabbed somebody 21 times. Oh. I was so furious with the chief psychologist that I couldn't go to work for two days because I was afraid I'd punch his face. I was afraid I'd beat the crap out of him. I had to stay out of work for two days. To, to, I was just I can, absolutely furious. I can imagine. I mean, and you're, you're literally sitting there thinking and saying, look, I, I, I literally knew exactly what was going to happen here. But they're, they're not concerned about that, clearly. No, he was saving money for the system. You know, he was being a good old boy. You know, they didn't care about the, the prisoner being stabbed. You know. So these patterns kept going, you know, from I spent 18 years in the in the state prison and then 10 years working psych, psych uh, crisis in hospital emergency rooms. So between them, these patterns just they, they kept growing, growing, growing. So just briefly, I'm going to go through them. They, the voices get louder after sunset. They get loudest between mm -hmm. three and four in the morning. That's odd. <laughs> that is a, a really you interesting know? one. Why would a that hallucination do that? Hour. Yeah. The voices get louder when ignored. So I don't know how many times I've heard psychiatrists go, well, they're just hallucinations. Just ignore them. Now I'd pull the patient in and say, well, how'd that go for you? They go, didn't work at all. They got louder consistently. This happened every time they tried to ignore them. They got louder. You know, why would a hallucination do that? They constantly fostered self-destructive behavior. You know, they fostered isolation. They didn't want these people being uh, sociable. They wanted them staying in their cells by themselves. Uh, in, in the mental health centers, they were staying in their bedrooms, listening to their voices and, and playing uh, acid rock. That's what the voices want. They they don't want them acid rock. With, Did they request that, that specific? Acid well, it, it's that kind of stuff, you yeah. know, that kind of rap, kind of you know, that mm -hmm. nasty stuff. Negative, negative stuff. More, more negative, negative, negative yeah. stuff. They loved it. They're feeding off it. So they foster isolation. Now, as we go through these, you look at these. This is the same garbage that's coming out of the mainstream media right now. It's the same garbage that came mm -hmm. out of them during the COVID. Yeah, it's the same entities on a macroscopic scale the same patterns you know look at look at this they you can't ignore them they're coming over the television they're coming over the radio they're coming over the, the internet they're broadcasting i just heard soros bought 21 radio stations right before the election mm -hmm. you know, so they're they're just they're just screaming you know they foster self-destructive behavior look at covid you know look at what happened there Look at the lies. Look at the, the, the blocking of the ivermectin. You know, they foster isolation. Don't go visit your friends. Don't go out to visit your family for Thanksgiving. Stay home. Lock yourself in the house. You know, watch the fleas on the wall. They, they would tell you to stick your kid in a room for five days if he's sick. And, and yeah. you know, leave, a, yeah. leave some soup at the door or something, which we, I mean, we, we get sick in this house. And we, we, we say, that, you know, we, we interact as we normally would because that's just nonsense to me. Yeah, so they demand the victim's attention. You know, what's what they're doing with the television right now. They maneuver for increased control over the victim. The voices do that with psychotics. The deep state is doing that with society. 
they gaslight. So the voices gaslight these things. They manipulate perception. They have compl- so they have complete access to the schizophrenic's memory. So in the lower band of frequencies, they can go into the schizophrenic's mind. They can pull up every rotten thing they've ever done and throw it in their faces until they get them upset. And they just remunerate over that stuff over and over and over again. They've brought up stuff with some patients that the patient had done 20 years ago and long forgot about. And they'd bring that up and throw it in his face. So they have access to the impatience and essentially their entire memories, I guess, once they're, well, once they're not, in there. The, the, lower, the lower realm of their memory. You know, not, not the higher realm, but the lower realm. What, what does realm, that mean the, exactly? The lower frequency things. You know, so the bad things they've done. Okay. That kind of stuff. They, they demand that the, uh, the victim not tell anybody about their presence. Okay, so the, the voices don't want the patient telling anybody about them being there. And the mainstream media doesn't want them, anybody knowing what's really going on and all the crap going on behind the scenes. It's all the same stuff, you know? It's just a hallucination. It's just a TV show. You know, it's, 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 you could really make this comparison across the board. Yeah, and then you look at all this stuff coming out now that they've, they've lied about that they've kept down. I mean, that's the other thing. The voices are consummate liars. They lie about everything. So does the mainstream media. I mean, it's the same entity. You know, the, the psychotic voices are the same entities that's coming out of the mainstream media right now in the deep state. They constantly steer their victim away from anything that might generate joy. You know, they don't want them feeling good. They can manipulate feeling without speaking. They short-circuit reason. Um, They pass themselves off as thoughts belonging to the victim. Uh, They foster selective forgetting. They fill the victim's mind with negative thoughts about themselves or others consistently. So Sherry, Sherry Sweeney, the uh, co-author of our book, she said that every negative thought that comes into your mind is coming in from them. It's coming in from the dark side. They destroy any sense of positive self-concept. Um, they're, averse, they're averse to almost anything positive. Um, th- those, are, those are the main ones. There's, there's some more. But anybody who's working with schizophrenics, anybody who's living with one, they can, they can go to my website at jerrymarzinki.com Go to the article section and pull up this list of patterns, and you will see them for yourself. They'll be right in front of your eyes. And again, if the voices are running patterns, then they're not hallucinations. Something else is going on. But yet the psychiatric mafia and Big Pharma are going, oh, hey, all you plebes out there, just believe us. Uh, these are these are hallucinations. Just take our, medi- our, our medicines and... Uh, we're making fourteen point seven billion dollars a year selling antipsychotic medicines. We don't. You just believe us. That's how much they're making. You know, something like fourteen billion dollars selling these antipsychotic medications, and these things shrink the patient's brain. You know, so they've been doing autopsies on these state pa- state mental Ill, mentally ill patients that, when they die, they do an autopsy. They see their brains are shrunk like walnuts from these mm-hmm. drugs that they're taking. From these these antipsychotic drugs, so when the researchers found that and they they printed this, some somehow they got it past the uh, universities, so, uh, you know, because the big pharma pretty much determines what the universities are going to print. You know, you don't you you push you you print something we don't like, man. We're going to take away your grants. You know, we're gonna, we're not going to fund your uh, journals anymore, and we're not going to give grants to your students. You know, they control the purse strings. So uh, when, when that was first discovered, uh, of course, the big pharma and the psychiatric mafia are jumping up going, oh, it's, it's not our drugs. It's the schizophrenia doing this. It's a, schizophrenia is causing their brains to rot out. You know, then the, the researchers went, well, OK, we'll see. So they started feeding these same antipsychotic drugs to mice and rats and, and uh, uh, monkeys. And the same thing happened. Oh, the mice had schizophrenia too, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so, so these are dangerous drugs. They, they, 
they destroy the person's neurological system with long-term use. They rot out their peripheral system. They rot out their ner- their brain. Which I have you know, to imagine if they're dealing with entities that in the long term, even if they can quiet them temporarily, if these drugs are shrinking their brain and you know, it's, it's making them even more susceptible, I would think, to these entities if yeah, they have less, yeah. less cognitive power of their own. I would think so. You know, and you, know, you look at the, you look at, you take a look at the, the psychiatrists who are running our mental health systems. You know, the suicide rate, you, know, you might think that the suicide rate of a of subpopulation says something about their mental health. Okay. So, you know, 4.9% of people with schizophrenia die by suicide. So their suicide rate is five to 10 times higher than the general population. Okay. Now, according to the Journal of, of the Me- American Medical Association, the suicide rate for schiz- for us psychiatrists is 65 out of 100,000 or 5.9 times that of the general population. So here, the high priests of mental health in this country are killing themselves at about the same rate as the most disturbed part of our population, the schizophrenics. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Well, if the, uh, if that, if the, uh, the class that's supposed to be Fixing the problems is as just as affected by them. Maybe that's a, an indicator of something. Well, they're, they're killing themselves at a higher rate than the general population. Higher rate. So the jur- Journal of Clinical Psychiatry in August of 1980 did a five-year study of 18,730 consecutive physician deaths by suicide and found that psychiatrists suicide regularly year by year at rates more than twice those expected. And these differences were statistically significant. These are the high priests that run our mental health system in the whole Western world, not just in the U.S. You know, and you, you look at the assault rate on them. You know, the assault rate for all jobs, based on a study of 120,000 assaults from 1987 to 1992, over those five years, the assault rate for all jobs was 12.6 per thousand. The assault rate for regular doctors, other than psychiatrists, was 16.2 per thousand. The assault rate for custody staff who were working around psychiatric patients 24 hours a day was 69 per thousand. The assault rate for psychiatrists, for the little bit of time they spend around these patients, you know, and in, in the state institutions and in private institutions, they might spend 20 minutes a week at the most in the state institutions, maybe 20 minutes a month. You know, very little time. So the assault rate on psychiatrists for the, very, the little time they spend around their patients was 65 per thousand or 5.9 times higher than that of the general population. Wow. wow. That's where the voices come in. Mm-hmm. They're being assaulted at a rate higher or as high as as the medical staff that are working around these patients 24 hours a day. You know, so I think they're a little bit afraid of the voices. Tell you the truth. You know, Do you have, they don't want to. <clears throat> I'm curious if you you ever obviously you've identified these as as being entities of their own and and I think it's really important for us to get into maybe your thoughts on on what makes people susceptible to these entities in the first place? You even said earlier, and this is a, a you know, the the idea that all the negative thoughts that come into our mind are, you know, they're not our own. They're from other similar type type of entities uh, trying to affect us and influence us. But for the most part, or at least at least a seemingly decent large uh, enough part of the, the population can hear these negative thoughts. I mean, look, and a lot of this this conversations I've had similar di- dialogues with the. Uh, um, you know, more religious, like, uh, you know, figures and stuff that describe it in, in pretty much a similar way that, you know, the, they're sort of like the arrows of demons. They'll, they'll, they'll fire them off and see what, you know, see what they can catch with their negative thoughts. But so what, what do you think differentiates someone that, you know, I can recall times in my life when I've been just driving my car and for no reason that makes any sense to me, not suicidal, never was, I would, a thought would enter my head like, huh, what if I just drove off this bridge? Didn't do it. What, didn't even think about actually doing it. It's just more like a thought that passed through my mind. And I would just think, yeah. why, would I, why would I even think that? I don't want to do that. And, I would and, and it was, 
And it was so bizarre that you go, well, the, you know, that where'd that come from? Because it didn't belong to you. Right, right. You know, it didn't belong to your normal thought pattern. That's them putting that thought into your mind. Mm -hmm. So they hit all of us. They don't just hit schizophrenics. They hit mm -hmm. us all. Mm -hmm. You know, every time something like that happens, that's them putting that thought into your mind. And, and even though you didn't act on it, it was like, it was still upsetting. It's like, well, why would I even think something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's a weird thing. It made me think like, what's wrong with me? Why would I even think? What the yeah, heck? yeah, I think right. About you know, and they're feeding off of that. Wow. And so what do you think makes the patients that end up in, in where you would see them that get all the way to the hospital, that get are the most extreme cases that are the most afflicted by these entities, what do you think makes someone more susceptible to that? Did you find any commonalities? Obviously, a one is going to be drugs. We we know that the drugs, whether they're people doing it on purpose, which they, many people in psychedelic circles will intentionally try to communicate with entities that they think are are good or helpful. Uh, right. Others are probably just trying to get high and not realizing what they're opening themselves up to. Well, yeah, that's one of them, you know, is is playing with Ouija boards. I've seen a lot of people go psychotic on Ouija boards and stay that way. Wow. They're dangerous. They're not toys. And these things are you know? literally just, I don't know if I think it, Toys R Us is out of business, but you get the point. They're up there in the toy stores right next to Monopoly and Parcheesi and everything else. No, that's, that's bad news. No, it's bad news. Like, you know, like I said, I've seen a lot of people go psychotic on those where they start moving around and they start talking, you know, with the VG boards and then the voice moves into their heads. You know, so you got that going on and they got the other drugs, but they... The most dangerous of all those drugs, as far as going psychotic, is amphetamine. Mm. I have I have seen more people go psychotic on amphetamine than any other drug. You know, it it starts off where they you know they're getting their high, they feel like Superman, they're feeling really good, uh, and it goes on for a long period of time, and they just keep upping the dose, upping the dose, and they're feeling really great, and then they crash, and then they do it all over again, and then. <clears throat> Along comes these voices while they're high. You know, it starts ta telling them you're rotten, you're no good, da 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 da, and they go, "Well, that's just a hallucination." You know, I'm just, and, I'm just a meth head. That's fine. No, yeah, I'm just a meth head. It's a it's a hallucination. It'll go away. Then they come down, and it does, and it may go away the next twenty times, but maybe the twenty first time, it doesn't, even and it's there for the rest even of if their they lives. Stop the drugs, even if they stop the drugs, it's there. The prison is full of them. Wow. It's full of them. Meth is a very dangerous drug. That's the prisoners a, called it, the, they called it the devil's drug. It's a, oh, that's a, it's pretty on the nose. It's, it's a, this, this is a much better anti-drug ad than any of those ones that, you know, Nancy Reagan was showing me in the 80s. And, <laughs> that, that's for sure. Yeah. So uh, meth and, and, you know, there, there are the ones that uh, they're doing this psychedelic thing and they're looking for a guru or it's a special spirit that speak to them they don't know who they're speaking with you know and that thing gets in their head and it won't come out so you got to be careful you know <laughs> don't assume that you know the, wh whoever you're channeling is a good spirit you know, because it, generally the bad ones try to get your confidence first right you know, like, i've heard oh, of people that had like actually, one somebody commented on a, a an interview I did a few months ago where he said, like, I actually, I started talking to someone who an, an entity that would start telling me he actually got me clean, got me off drugs and alcohol, and then I realized that it just made me even more egotistical and and led me down this darker path into the occult and doing all this other stuff because I, I thought, oh, this ended, this thing helped me out. I can listen to it, and then it would send him down this darker path when he really yeah. finally realized like oh yeah so even even the good thing which yeah ostensibly uh, you know, getting off drugs or whatever is a good thing but it can also just be a way to build the trust to lead you into the darker thing yeah so that's pretty common you know and then the, the i think one of the biggest ones is trauma mm -hmm. yeah. you know and psychiatry and psychology don't have any decent treatment for trauma and depression you know what they're doing is they're drugging the brain. That doesn't cure anything. And these regular psychotherapies, they don't work worth a darn either. You know, you just bring up the trauma and you rehash it over and over and over and it gets worse each time. You know, so until just recently, there was nothing out there that would deal effectively with trauma. And then along comes John Mace in Australia 
who's a ship captain. <laughs> he's not a psychiatrist. He's not a psychologist. He's a ship captain. He's driving these big freighters back and forth across the ocean. You know? But he was intensely interested in how the mind worked. So he read all these psychology stuff. He read all the all this philosophy stuff. Um, he he was widely read. I guess he had a lot of time going back and forth across the ocean to read. And he was intensely interested in how the mind worked. And he found that the mind didn't work like you would think it would. He said the mind, all it does is take pictures of where you put your attention. And it can turn, uh, it can turn emotions. It can turn concepts. It can turn thoughts and ideas into pictures. And once that picture is formulated, then the emotional charge associated with it can then be discharged. So he was able to discharge traumas to the point where after you went through this MACE method, you would remember the trauma, but there wouldn't be, it would be like, no big deal. Okay, I, I remember it. That's it. There was, there's no emotional aff affect to it. Okay? It works better than anything I've ever seen. Yeah. So there, there's not a lot of uh, MACE practitioners out there right now. But for those of you who don't want to take these toxic psychiatric medicines, okay, go to causisminstitute.com. And you can read about this new therapy, and you can find yourself a practitioner. This stuff really works, and it's a lot cheaper than these psychiatric drugs that poison your brain and your body and don't work in the long run. And that, that method is specifically to heal trauma. So, it, and is it like, is trauma just one of several perhaps anchors that these these entities can use to sort of latch onto a person? Yeah, ma matter of fact, I've heard that they hang around those traumas and mm -hmm. that if anything sets them off, they're, si they're sitting there throwing gas on the fire, okay? So what psychiatry and psychology are doing don't, doesn't work. It doesn't work. And, and let, let's take a look at their report card, okay? In the United States, every year, almost 50,000 people kill themselves. There's more psychiatrists. There's more psychologists. There's more psychiatric drugs on this planet now than have ever existed in the history of mankind. And this is just in the United States. Some other countries are probably worse. Okay? So suicide is the 11th leading cause of death in the United States. The C CDC reports that 132 people in the U.S. kill themselves every day. 50,000 people, that's as many as had died in, in Vietnam, in the whole war. Fifty, And this is happening year after year after year after year, with more and more psychiatrists being graduated every year, more and more psychologists, you know. What, are the, what, what, good, are, what good are they doing? You know, it's a, between 2000 and 2018, suicide rates increased 37%. An estimated 24 veterans kill themselves daily in the U.S. You know, from, from 2006 to 2016, the suicide rate increased 2% a year with 1.4 million suicide attempts in 2017 and 47,000 deaths. This is the psychiatric report card. This is the report card for psychiatrists and psychologists. I'd give them an F minus. Not the best scores from Professor Jerry, that, that's for sure, <laughs> from, from the psychiatric community. Um, Jerry, there's one more th thing I kind of want to dig into a little bit deeper because we haven't gone too far down the the rabbit hole of what these entities really are and your own your own sort of revelation of, of, of coming to understand not just that they are entities, but what those entities are. And I'm curious, we didn't really get into this at all, so I don't know what if you had a, a religious upbringing of your own before you got into this or if... Is it this this these encounters with these entities that that put you more like learning more about the religious side of things? So maybe you could just speak on that in whatever way it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a little bit of both because I told you the Boy Scout story. Mm -hmm, yeah, that probably yeah. sent me back ten years. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it was ten years before I started going to church after that episode. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, I I believed in God. You know that that there was a God. Um, I wasn't super religious. 
but I was always reading spiritual stuff. You know, I, I was always reading, uh, I'd read Carlos Castaneda. I'd, I'd, I'd read uh, um, yeah, just all kinds of spiritual stuff, but not necessarily Bible or Christian stuff. And it, 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 it kind of fed my soul. Um, and then when I started getting into, into this stuff, it was like, um, well, okay, if there's this dark side, mm -hmm. then, then there's got to be a good side. I mean, this is a dualistic universe. There's heat, there's cold, there's dark, there's light, yeah. there's good, there's bad. I mean, it, there's all these, you know, opposites. So <clears throat> then I started reading more and more on the spiritual side, uh, until I hit, uh, a, a fellow by the name of Emanuel Swedenborg. Mm -hmm. He was a Christian mm -hmm. mystic that lived some 300 years ago. I, we need to do a multi-hour show on Swedenborg. He's, on he's Swedenborg a fasc alone. fascinating character. Fascinating. Yep. So I just, well, the first time, first time I, I, I mean, it was, it was weird because I, I had a, a staunch Catholic friend and I was, I was over his house one day and here's this book with this drawing of a, kind of like a 1700 character with a wig on, you know, the white wigs that yeah. they wore. And it says, uh, Emanuel Swedenborg. And I looked at that. It grabbed my attention for some strange reason. And I asked, uh, Ken, I said, who's Swedenborg? He goes, you don't know who Swedenborg is. I never heard of him. Take a you know? seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said, take that book. Yeah. So I took it and, and I, I was like, holy cow, look at this. You know, and then when I got, I went and got heaven and hell, and I could not put it down. I almost read myself half to death. You know, so then I went to to Swedenborg. Now, what what Swedenborg? After fifty years of being one of the top scientists of his day, and the chief mining engineer for the Queen of Sweden, making her a fortune. You know, Christ has uh, uh, showed up and told him and said, "Listen, okay, drop all this science stuff. I'm going to give you access to heaven and hell." I want you to go there and you talk to the people in these places and then come back and write about those discussions and and teach people on the planet what's going on there. Okay? So I fell into that and it was like, it was incredible stuff. But you were asking about the voices themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that might be a good time for you to get, for us to get into the transcript. So this is an okay. actual session that I was holding with a prisoner who eventually did recover, fully recovered. Okay. That wasn't supposed to happen. I got in trouble at the prison for this. Oh, we you know? can't have recoveries. We can't sell drugs no. that way. No. Yeah. But it's like, that's not supposed to happen. So this was a prisoner I was working with for quite a while. And I just kind of randomly went and picked one of these transcripts out. So I don't even know where this was. It was, uh, 8-1-2002, where this took place, and it's in the prison. So I'm talking to this guy, and what I was doing was trying to figure out how the voices work, what they do, how they operate, and how I could interfere with them. So I was constantly asking these prisoners, you know, questions. I was bombarding them with questions. I was giving them stuff to do to try and, and try it for a week and come back and tell me how the voices reacted to this, you know. So it, it, it was it was a perfect experimental situation. It was uh, uh, it's great, you know. And and they were they were coming. I, every once in a while, it got a little thick because you know one of them would come back and say, "Well, this guard disrespected me in front of all these other prisoners. I need to do something about it. You need to you know beat the crap out of them or stab them or something." And uh, so that it was a little tricky there because. If I turned him into security for saying that, and the rest of them found out that I had turned him in, that would be it. Yeah, they'd never trust me again. You know, so I had to. What I did was increase the number of sessions I had with that guy until he calmed down, or anybody like him. You know, so every once in a while it got a little, it got a little thick. So here I am talking to this guy in session, and I said, uh, he he tells me the voices started coming back once a day now, so. We're working on reducing the amount of time that the voices are showing up, doing things that make them not come back as well. He said, I can feel them in the wings. He said, they start off by whispering, how are you? And I ask him, well, what do you do? He said, I completely ignore them and start praying. 
I don't talk to them at all. I generally ignore them. If you give them any recognition at all, then they put their foot in the door. And I asked him, well, how long does it take for them to go away once you start praying and asking for help? He said, about 15 minutes. So prayer works if you stay at it. He says, how about the fits they usually throw when you ignore them? Do they go ballistic on you? He said, no. I have to give them the, the time of day before they can, they can get, some, uh, get into throwing their hissy fits. I asked him, do you have a whole, a whole lot more peace than before? He said, yes, much more. So he's doing these things that we found that fight back against the voices. He's saying they, they too. I'm just curious. Is he, is he saying, saying they in terms of are there multiple voices? Yes. Multiple different, so there's multiple entities at once can be affecting a person. Yeah, yeah there's several. He's hearing several. You know, and one by one, they're dropping out. So I, I asked him, do you miss the voices? He said, no, not anymore. He said, I used to. They used mm -hmm. to be more part of me than, than I was. Wow, that's interesting. And I asked him, I said, are they the same voices you have been hearing all these years? They don't change? He said, nope, they're the same ones. They don't change. Well, how many voices continue to come to visit you now? He says two. He had three before. I said, is that the same number as before or less? He said one less. Was, was the one who disappeared one of the weaker ones? He said, no, it was the strongest one. And I was surprised. I said, really? He goes, yeah. I said, what do you think happened to him? He said, well, I've been praying on a regular basis now. It seems that the strongest one couldn't stand the constant prayer. I said, have you ever forged a better link with the positive spirits? He said, yes, the demons try to disguise themselves as good spirits. What do you do? Uh, what do the good spirits do for you? So he said, they help me pray when the bad spirits come. The prayers get louder inside and overcome the bad voices. What kind of things do the good spirits tell you? They tell me to be appreciative of what I have, and I'll get more. They tell me to stay in prayer and to give thanks for what's going on around me. Okay? So, you know, that's that's just a little glimpse. So are, are, when he... Because you mentioned there too, like the good, the the bad spirits can sometimes disguise themselves as good spirits. So, do you think he's describing good spirits disguising themselves as bad spirits, or are there, you think there's actually good spirits as well that do actually come and maybe try to help people sometimes? I, I, I think I think there are. In his case, um, well, in one one other case, it was the guy's mother. You know, so um, we were working on. He had he had a number of bad voices. Matter of fact, that's the second transcripts I have here. If you want me to read it, but. He would hear bad voices, but he would hear his mother. And I was very suspicious. And I said, you know, if, if, the, if the one that seems good tells you one bad thing, that would be it. So he would tell me about his mother coming and helping him. And I'd ask him, what did she say? And it was stuff like, uh, brush your teeth, uh, don't get into fights, don't sell drugs, don't use drugs, stay out of trouble in the prison yard, wash your underwear, you know, stuff mothers would say. Yeah. And that went on for months and months and months. So this this voice that his mother was never said anything bad. It just said stuff like the mother would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he was he was working um toward getting rid of the voices and he finally succeeded. Okay, the voices were gone. He didn't have to take the meds anymore. So we finally got rid of them. And um uh, at the very end, uh before I was assigned to another unit, he says, uh, my mother wants to talk to you. And I went, that's strange. His deceased mother wants to talk to me. And I, I said, I, I wasn't said, trying to be a character in this, in this part of the story, but <laughs> all right, let's okay. So I said, well, okay. What she got to say. And she said, thank you for helping my son. And I said, well, you're very welcome. He, he did a good job. You know, and I went to ask her another question, and uh, she said something to the effect as, I'm not supposed to be talking to you. He, she said, everything you need to know is in the Bible. And then it turned out that like two weeks later, she disappeared, and, and this, he never heard from her again. Interesting. So it was like she hung around to help him through this. Had his mother recently passed? I mean, maybe time doesn't matter as much in our human concept of time, but I'm just curious if it was a, a recent thing. No, no, it wasn't recent. Interesting. You know, it was, it was a good while back. Now, 
Now, I also have transcripts from a psychotic killer who's talking about his voices, if you want to hear that. Well, you know, Jerry, it's it's not every day someone offers to read me a transcript from a, a possessed psychotic killer, so I don't think I could turn it down. <laughs> okay, this guy killed uh, three people. He uh, He killed two in a drug deal. He shot him to death, and he murdered his girlfriend and cut her into little pieces, and they still have not found her body. Oh. He almost killed his mother. So his mother was the one who sent sent me this, and he, he wrote this, and he goes, uh, it, it's labeled, there is a monster, okay? And he says, there is a monster that lives in my head. This monster is real. It's not under my bed. My mother, my mother tells me things to do. So I'm, I'm having a hard time reading it because it's uh, his writing and it's also fading in and out. Gotcha, gotcha. It, it, it tells me sometimes when the news is new. My monster is crying as it, it spent all the years drowning out my courage and disposing my fears. My monster is strong. That's what I like to think. My monster is coming when it's time to drink. So when he drank, the, when he drank, the monster got out of control. My monster is is ready. My monster is strong. What will I do when my monster is gone? My monster will never leave. That is his plan. It overwhelms me when I'm making a stand. So basically, the monster is fighting through him when he gets into a fight. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a monster inside me. I thought it was strong. How could this be? My monster was a, has a name too. He walks in the dark, whispering Yahoo. My monster is watching me. He won't tell you my name. He won't tell you my name. My monster is the shadows you cannot see. His heart is heavy. He plays He plays for the game. My monster is aware. He wants to be monster. He's he he's as blood from a lake. His bond is with me. Now monster he has nothing else to do. My monster awake. You know, this guy killed three people. Wow. Or the or the monster did it through him, depending on you know, well the monster you want, you want the monster things. did the monster did it through him. So and a lot of these guys, you know, these these serial killers who shoot a bunch of people, they don't even remember doing it. Oh yeah. yeah, you know something yeah. takes them over. It's uh, I remember one patient I was working with. Um, the the voices told him that to to get his gun, get in his car, and drive it till he ran out of gas. Now this is in the emergency room when I was working in the emergency room, um, and he did that. He ran out of gas. He took his gun, walked out into the desert sat down, cocked the gun, put it to his head. He was about to fire it when a bird, he said a strange bird that he'd never seen before, just showed up in a tree near him and just started screaming at him, just yeah. raising all kinds of racket. So he took the gun and he took a shot at it and the blast of the gun going off woke him up. And he looks at the gun in his hand and he goes, what was I about to do? So it was like he was hypnotized. And that's the same thing with these serial killers. A lot of times they don't remember doing it. You know, they'll tell the judge, I, I don't remember doing it or I didn't do it. The that's voice is saying that's the sound of the gun that woke him up because it's often right after the act of killing that these like killers and assassins will, you know, that's when, that's when they wake up too. And like, what, what, what happened? What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's these voices that are taking them over. You know, just kind of like MK Ultra, they take over these these people. They they brainwash, and they get them to kill people. Which makes me wonder: is you know, is 
is MK Ultra creating another personality for someone, and or is MK Ultra just letting something in and just maybe directing it a little more with their own arcane knowledge? Well, they're they're they're, they're creating the trauma, okay, and then they program the trauma. So just like the, these schizophrenics, I mean, virtually all of them were horrendously traumatized at some point, you know. So the CIA and MK Ultra, they just artificially produce that trauma and then then program the person to go out and murder somebody yeah that's where a lot of these shootings are coming from you know well let's take away the guns well we got to get these drones to go out and shoot a bunch of people so to, before we can take, take away the, the ouija boards that's what we that's what we ought to be banning yeah, you know? take away the keep, ouija keep the guns you need those but the ouija boards I'm, I'm for banning those i think at this point um <laughs> So I, I, I guess one thing I, I want to I want to try to wrap up pretty soon. You've been really generous with your time, but I, I, I am kind of curious more. Like, so have you? You mentioned this one last person that that sort of gotten the voices out. Have you ever seen people that have gone as far? I mean, this this doesn't sound that different than a full on possession in, in a lot of times, depending on the extreme, you know, the extreme. Oh, of, oh of yeah, the a full on possession is way different. Oh, is it? Okay. You know, I've okay. I've seen that too. Okay. You know, I, I, this was working uh, in one of the emergency rooms. Um, there was a guy in California. The the parents got a job in Arizona. Okay, this this son of theirs was psychotic, and he was living with a girlfriend and trying to maintain. And he couldn't hold a job, and the girl was working, and she was uh, she was kind of supporting him, and he was getting more and more violent. Um, and what happened is one night she, she she would lock her bedroom door because she she was actually afraid of him, you know. And she was going, "Well, he's just he he'll get over this. He's just having a bad time." And then she started realizing, "No, he's not going to get over this." And then one day at like uh, four o'clock in the morning, she hears the front door open, and he leaves the apartment with this big butcher knife, and he goes out into the lawn, and he kneels down and he starts stabbing the ground with this big butcher knife. Over and over and over again, and he, she, she can see this in the lights from outside of the apartment, and that really weirded her out. So she called the cops and and she said, "I don't want this guy here, you know, take him out." He was beaten on the door trying to get in there. She locked him out. She told him the cops were coming, and and he ran. Otherwise, he probably would have eventually killed her. Um, but he had nowhere to go, so his parents took him back. And he got a bus and, and came to Arizona. He's living with his parents. And every time they called him his birth name, what what name they really knew him as, he would get furious. And he would say, no, I'm not Jake or whoever it was. I'm, I'm Ron. Don't call me Jake. And he would get furious. You know, he goes, I am not your son. Hmm. And and okay. then he he started beating up the father when his father called him his real name. So one of the other sons came and beat the crap out of him and threw him in the room. Okay. And <clears throat> he was brought into the ER and he was, com he was virtually completely taken over. He believed he was totally somebody else. So that's the difference is that it, there wouldn't really be voices in a, in a full on possession like that because the voice, there's only one voice now it's whatever entity yep. has fully taken that person over. Whereas with this, the schizophrenia situation, the person is there. Maybe the entities are trying, would like to get more control, but there's there's a right. battle going on, I guess. Right. There's a battle going on. There's always a battle going on with mm -hmm. the normal schizophrenic. Or the ones who are taken you could, over. You could say there's a battle going on at, at all times right. with all of us. Some of us are just, you know, winning it a little better, I guess. Right. Yeah. We're getting along a little better than they are, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but yeah, like you said, they're taking over. They are now the voice. They are now being run by this entity that has taken them over, where the normal schizophrenic is still fighting it. You know, no, I don't want to do that thing, or I'm not going to do that thing. You know, um, and and it's a it's a constant battle. It's a Would battle you say for their a, attention. A normal schizophrenic, as you sort of refer to them, is is still sort of maybe with the right guidance or the right recognition, or and maybe that is such a big problem of this is that you're one of the only people in this field to actually acknowledge that these voices are real, that it's not them that are crazy. They're perhaps being driven crazy by a real voice, but it's not their fault. Whereas yeah. so much of this, the medical industry is basically telling them, 
it's your fault. You're just nuts. Sorry. Right. Right. And they so much appreciate that. I mean, mm-hmm. I've had one guy write me uh, over email. He said, thank you for what you're doing. Now that I know it's not me, I can handle this. Right. Right. You know, and once what you realize psychiatry- maybe uh, it's just a voice, like they can't actually make you do these things. It's got to be very empowering. It's got to be, well, screw you. Get out of my head. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Because if you think it's you. Right. Then, you can't, can't then get them out. You, you, can't, you can't get them out. You can't do anything about it. So what are you going to do to yourself? Because it appears to be you. It appears to be them. It, it, it doesn't sound any different than your regular voice. It's not like this voice comes up in your head and goes, you do this thing. It's not like that. It sounds just like the other thousands of voices that you hear all day long running in your head. And that's not you either. So when you're listening to all this crap running through your head all the time, if you think that's who you are, then ask yourself, who's listening to that? (laughs) Who's listening to that garbage running through your head? That's the real you, the one who's listening to it. And that one who's... The one who's thinking, why would I think that? That's the you. (laughs) The one that's like, I I wouldn't drive off the bridge. That's stupid. That's me. (laughs) Right. That's you. You know? And, And it's also the one going... You know, why is this thing telling me to do this? I don't want to do this. You know, you're not your thoughts. You're the one who chooses your thoughts. You know, like the Indians say, you've got two wolves on your shoulder. The one you feed the most is the one that's going to grow. You can choose what thoughts you want to put your attention on. Everyone, when you put your attention on something, you're giving it your energy. You know, so you, 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 when you put your attention on the thought, you're giving that thought your energy. You're reinforcing that thought. You're feeding that thought. And, and when the voices are putting negative thoughts in your head and you're putting, paying your attention to them, you're going to eventually turn into those voices. You know, it's, it's strange. It's a strange world. It, it, I mean, it's a strange world is a great way to sum up, sum up this conversation, Jerry. But I, I think your your work is, is so important because, like I said, I mean, there there are certainly a, a lot of, you know, people in the, in the religious world who will certainly have probably over the many years have been. I mean, in fact, hundreds of years ago or, or I mean, thousands of years ago, some, wherever in there, maybe even tens of thousands of years ago and even before the Bible, there were probably people that really understood what was going on here um, that the idea of a, a hospital or a, this is probably never, never even come up because we didn't, we hadn't created these sort of modern you know, institutions yet. It was probably just like, Oh yeah, this guy's possessed. Uh, he's dealing with some demons. We got to get, you know, he's dealing with spirits and they would probably do some sort of practice that would certainly be more beneficial than the pills they give them today. Well, well, yeah, you look at the, you look at the Bible. I mean, Jesus cast these, these entities out of people some 23 times in the Bible, you know, and today it's like, Oh, the Christians are like thrown in the back seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's demons, so you put them, throw them in the back seat. Just don't pay any attention to them. It doesn't work that way. They come up and they bite you in the butt. The the biggest deception that the, the devil has has in, per, perpetuated on the human race is that he doesn't exist. The voices don't want to be known. They're punished if they're found out. They're punished. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's a, you mean punished by higher level entities? There's there's levels of these things. You know, there's the plebes, the ones that attack the schizophrenics, the regular voices. Then they have like sergeants and lieutenants, and then they have something very similar to the nephilim mm. up there, kind of ruling the whole the whole kingdom. Okay. So these are all. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we can be pretty on the nose about it at this point. I mean, you, you believe these are all the fallen angels of the Bible, essentially, or they're sort of you know whatever lower level level entities operate underneath them in this in this hierarchy. Yeah, and you know, you look at the the Bible. It's these the, these these demons were cast down onto the earth. <laughs> That's where they were put. No. Man, couldn't we have put so, them somewhere so, else? I mean, just <laughs> so the, those of you who are more interested in in how we came to the conclusion that these voices are energetic entities, you, you might want to take a look at this. It's how we came there. You know um, what the voices were, how they operate, um, how psychiatry operates, and and what a failure they've been. And the book, for those not watching the video, there's an audio version too. It is An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind. And that is, it's available on Amazon. Is that the best place for people to buy it? Or is it better to go to your website? 
Amazon's the well, best. Well, yeah, you can get it out through the website at uh, lulu.com. Which one gets you more money? That's that's what I want to know. The want, Lulu. Am- right. Amazon doesn't give us hardly anything. All right. Well, I'll give, us- you know, you can all make your decisions out there. Obviously, it's Amazon's easy for everybody, but if people know that they like to you to get more of it, they can go to Lulu. And uh, so I'll, I'll try to share all those links in the show notes. Okay. But- well, Jerry, thank you so much uh, again uh, for your generous time. I think your work is just, uh, it's ex- incredibly important. And I, I don't know if I, I wish there was some way to get your work in academic format that your colleagues would actually take a look at probably not going to happen maybe podcast is the best we're going to do right now uh but, but we'll see but uh i really do thank you so much for your time if you want to run through one more time uh, all the ways people can find your work your website and all that stuff feel free to plug well, away. yeah they can go to jerry you know everything's there um oh, there's there's scores of of videos and those of you who really want a psychotherapy that works i mean actually works you know, go to causisminstitute.com and find yourself a therapist there. They'll they'll tell you about it. This stuff works. It's it's not like the the psychotherapy where you just repeat the same stuff over and over and over again. And what's interesting about it is the therapist doesn't have to know what the trauma is for it to work. Mm. You know, so if you were sexually molested or had something horrible done to you that you you don't want to be digging up over and over again, you don't have to. You know, it works anyway. All you have to do is you have to remember. You have to know it. You don't have to tell the therapist what it is. Interesting. And it's gone. It's gone in an hour. And that just takes away one more anchor that one of these entities can use to try to latch on to you. Exactly. To try to rub it. So is it that they do they take the trauma and just rub it in their face? Is it like, oh, yes. remember? And then so then once you've and if you're not healed from that trauma, then, of course, that is so much more effective. So if you can yeah. get rid of it on your own. Then that makes that the voice of the so right. Effect. And what I hear is they hang around in the area of that trauma, and then when <laughs> when something happens in your psychological area that triggers that trauma, you know, say your your dad was a real bastard, you know, and somebody appears that's like your dad. This this buried stuff that that you buried alive starts wanting to break out. So it tells you, you either attack that guy or you run from him or you avoid him. But in any case, there's a major upset that happens when you run into somebody like that. Causism goes in there and gets that out and, and, and releases that energy. So it's no longer there. It no longer exists. And what it feels like after that is, okay, I remember my dad, you know, but there's no, there's no charge. There's no emotional charge to it. And that's gone. Gotcha. And if you, if, if you don't have the emotional charge, then it can't be used against you. So I think that's right. a great thing to look into. Uh, Jerry, thank you so much for your time. Once again, check out the website, check out the book, uh, extremely important work. And I uh, hope to talk to you again soon, Jerry. Take care. Okay.